and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, the 1918 flu pandemic, Voices from the Past. My name is Deborah Hoffman and I organize programs and events for the library. Thanks for tuning in. Before we start, I wanna let you know how the evening will go. Our speaker will do a 40 minute presentation and then he'll field questions. To ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. Russell A. Johnson is a proud Waltham High School grad, class of 1976, and has been curator for history of medicine and the sciences at UCLA Library Special Collections since 2008. Along with a BA in psychobiology from Bowdoin College, he holds master's degrees in physiological psychology, now known as behavioral neuroscience, and library and information studies from UCLA. Russell was honored twice as UCLA Librarian of the Year in 2009 for building a collection of baby record books, which opened up a new area in historical childhood studies, and in 2019 for mentorship and outreach, including noteworthy teaching with rare and unique materials. When COVID closures hit two years ago, he turned to the collection he will discuss today and used it with media outlets such as the Los Angeles Times and for Zoom talks around the country. And now bringing it all back home to Waltham, welcome Russell and thank you. Great, thank you. Let's see if I can find my screen. And here we go. All right, great. Well, welcome. Um, I was just in Waltham for one evening a week ago, and I went. I ate at the Chateau, so I, I, now I'm back. Uh, 14 years ago, I got thinking about primary sources in support of teaching and research on the then upcoming centenary of the 1918-1919 global pandemic of so-called Spanish influenza, or the flu, that killed 650,000 people in the U.S. back when the population was one-third of what it is today, so COVID has proved half as lethal nationally. And perhaps as many as 50 million people worldwide more than died from combat and wounds in World War I. I soon learned about University of Michigan's massive online 1918 Influenza Digital Archive project with thousands of digitized publications. The site's Influenza Encyclopedia is an amazing research and teaching tool, allowing keyword searching to gather documents, we're getting you started with a well-researched essay on the history of the pandemic in a particular community, such as Boston, with links to content from the newspapers of the time. People depended on the daily and extra editions of their local newspapers, and the powers that be used newspapers as a vehicle to broadcast advisories to the public, or commenting on those advisories. Here we see a cartoon about the popularity of LA Health Commissioner Luther Power's closure order on schools, churches and movie theaters from October 11th until early December. Newspapers on the Influenza Encyclopedia site show us that in September 1918, quote, influenza cases are on the increase, that death lists are daily growing larger, but physicians still insist that the epidemic has not gotten beyond their control. Quote, doctors say that if people will not lose their heads, the task of checking the grip which is a, a centuries old French term for influenza, will be much easier. The daily warning about avoiding coughers and sneezers is repeated, and those who are suffering from slight attacks are asked again to stay home and get well instead of mingling with others. However, in mixed messaging, we also learn the epidemic is now raging in a total of nine huge army training camps on the home front. And with more than 5% of the body, student body ill, Somerville Public Schools continued to be closed. In addition, quote, Waltham Hospital is struggling under great handicaps with 20 nurses stricken, and it has been necessary to press into service every recruit from the Waltham Training School for Nurses, which you see here. In a report of the death of a worker in Waltham, we see a common progression of the disease. John Matthews in Waltham died following a short illness caused by pneumonia, superinduced or, or coming from influenza. 
Two days, two weeks later, we see that the 30,000 residents of Waltham are hit nearly twice as hard in one day per capita as larger cities, Brockton and Worcester. Did I say that right, Worcester? At the same time, news of the day focuses on the war effort and quote, army officers declare the allies are in a position to continue smashing the enemy and an armistice might enable the enemy to escape for a time the defeat which now stares him in the face. In December, this wave of influenza is waning and an editor uses an odd diminutive of the disease's name that I never saw anywhere else. <clears throat> in UCLA's collections, we already had the papers of Rose Bowers, a contract surgeon who was recruited to serve as an anesthesiologist at Camp Grant in Rockford, Illinois. Her archives included mimeographed information bulletins issued in September and October by the chief medical officer at this massive US Army training camp, starting a week into an epidemic that arrived with what he called, quote, an explosive nature. The bulletins document tremendous emergency shortages in personnel supplies and space. All two-story barracks were pressed into service as hospital wards, for example. They track the swift, overwhelming rise of influenza and mortality in the soldier patients. Two weeks in, we see 525 new admissions and 46 deaths in just one day at this one camp. And the medical officer muses on what helps and what doesn't for a disease with no specific treatment or absolute preventive. Quote, the wearing of masks and gowns, the frequent washing of the hands and avoiding putting the hands in mouth or nose are very important. Persons must avoid crowding, whether on duty or not, unquote. Something nearly impossible to do at a military training camp. This is one of our very first individual acquisitions picked up on eBay. A telegram from the mayor's office in San Francisco to the mayor of Santa Barbara describes the campaign to get people to wear face masks. They were encouraged on October 20th and required in the city on the 21st. By the 25th, daily cases of influenza dropped by 50% compared with five days earlier. But where were regular people's letters and diaries? They were scattered in individual archives or personal website or, or historical societies and not at UCLA. So I started buying on eBay using some money off of uh, an, uh, an endowment fund. Like a couple of letters from this cadet who was training to support balloon reconnaissance observers advising his family to stay on the farm and saying, while influenza raged in Los Angeles and Pasadena on October 15th, no cases were reported nearby at his camp. We built a teaching and research collection of more than 300 letters and diaries and printed ephemera from scratch, piece by piece. From these, you can assemble the story of the impact of the pandemic on the lives of soldiers here and overseas and on families on the home front mostly American granted and mostly, but not all English language. Getting interest from UCLA faculty has been a dud so far, but we loaned the entire collection three different times across town to Loyola Marymount University for Professor Carla Biddle's Health and Disease in American Culture undergrad seminar for their term papers and a couple of senior projects. Carla wanted students to hold and explore century old letters and diaries to struggle with and figure out how to read cursive handwriting and to consider the words and phrases and styles in which people communicated, such as Harold writing to his girlfriend during the spring 1919 wave. Quote, there are an awful lot of people dying just now on account of the flu. A little girl next door was buried today and there's a lady up the street a ways that is pretty sick and my little sister is just getting over it. So I guess it is pretty near my turn for everyone in our family has had it, but me but I'm not asking for it when I say that. I sure can get along without it. Nellie Driggs, a high school teacher in Richmond, Indiana, kept a daily diary with details on the weather, chores, interactions with family and friends, notes on current events locally, such as the dry law going into effect, closing all of the breweries and saloons, and in the country, a coal shortage, Liberty Loan drives, and the progress of offenses in World War I. She names films and performances she attends, letters from and about specific soldiers, and opinions about news and war events. On the 5th of October, Nellie begins reporting news about the impact of influenza. Quote, Ed and Hattie did not come as I expected, but was best as I feel badly. Dr. Kruger says, 
heavy cold, form of la grippe. She adds up above, mother took influenza. And in the next entry, Monday, October 7th, a federal and state order came to close schools on account of Spanish influenza. And notice the, the capitalization, Spanish influenza. It's kind of an unfamiliar term. Sunday, October 13th, <clears throat> our last gasoline list Sunday and flu ban, and here she puts it in quotes, again, like it's unfamiliar, and flu ban on. So Orange County was an exciting place to be in. Then she explains what the ban means. All shows, churches, pool rooms, and places where people gather is closed. As we skip forward past celebrations on November 11th and look at the following Monday when schools had reopened, so many children were absent on account of flu and it had increased so rapidly that the ban was put on Wayne County again on December 1st. She then ponders, quote, the war machinery is working now in a different direction. Plans are being made to send men home from all camps that wish to be released and mustering out those needed least. Although it did take a very long time to get soldiers um, back from overseas. I mean, many were the occupational force and it just took, it took ages um, coming across in, in steamer ships. And just in case you wonder <clears throat> whether it was all, whether all is forgiven concerning the Germans now under the American occupation force a week after the armistice, Along the inner margin, we see a very bitter afterthought, which stung me to read, given the otherwise lightness of Hildreth's spirit. Huns are begging for food. Let them beg a little. Wow. There are several other diaries which make for fascinating reading as well. Their catalog records help by quoting the influenza material. Clarence Garrett of Torrington, Connecticut, worked for the American Brass Company and did home service with the Interior Guard. He read Zane Gray, complained about the high price and rationing of everyday staples like eggs, flour, tobacco, and soap, and is married, but doesn't mention his wife, Jean, much. He notes the progression of influenza throughout town and people who died. In the final posting of the diary, October 13th, he writes, all churches are closed on account of influenza. Believe me, it's some quiet town. It's some quiet about town. Now, like our baby record books, my focus going into this was medical content, physical development and illness and death and so forth in the baby books, influenza in these letters and diaries. But when you build a collection from scratch and make it big enough, it becomes ripe for research purposes you didn't anticipate, which is a very good thing. For example, some researchers love to find daily weather reports and diaries to put things in context. And Clarence Garrett does not disappoint there. In fact, he editorializes in a wonderful manner. January 11th, some ice still on the trees. Looks pretty in the light of street lamps. January 20th, dirty weather coming, I'm afraid. January 27th, clear moon, a nice night if I were in God's country. Clear, still stars like glittering points of ice, so cold they look. March 19th, a spring day. I have a cold in my head and I feel mean. April 4th, clear and starlit. We are nearing the glory days. Soon we can really live. Why must all the dear beauty of green trees and street sweet flowers give place to the cold barrenness of winter? Last summer commenced in June and was gone by September. Cold days came in October and continued with few warm ones until this week. Six months is a pretty long winter. Great writing. Back to influenza with some New England examples. Two real photo postcards show the rear of the Addison Gilbert Hospital in Gloucester with its outbuildings and field in 1918. Postcard number one shows an empty field. Postcard number two shows dozens of white tents in the field pitched in even rows with boardwalks along one opening of each tent. White clad nurses are seen standing or walking. Some patients may be visible. The second postcard is dated to approximately September 1918, when the influenza pandemic swept through Gloucester with staggering effect. Clement, a serviceman in the Naval Aviation Deta uh, det Detachment at MIT, writes to his mother on September 22nd, quote, every day is Sunday here, but today is the first day I felt well enough to write, and I'm doing this in bed. I never was very sick until I got, in, got to service. 
Then I had to have two operations. And now I've got the Spanish influenza. The hospital here on the grounds is fine, nice and light, airy and roomy. We have two large tables in my ward, the main ward, which are decorated with some costly flowers, great tall affairs of rich color. I never saw their like before. He then advises his mother to get into Red Cross work for the war effort. In the second letter, Clement writes to his parents on October 2nd from the Longwood Country Club in Chestnut Hill near Boston. Okay, remember, writing from Chestnut Hill. He comments about meeting various heirs of major fortunes who are helping nurse people back to health. He hopes Turkey and Germany will be overwhelmingly defeated so they cannot wage war again. Recovering from influenza, he writes, quote, I doubt if I will be allowed to go home for a while yet. The school itself at MIT is still in quarantine. We have great freedom out here in the country and everyone is content to stay so long as possible. And the doctor's orders are for us to remain until we are back in our pins, safe and sound. In a third undated letter, he concludes, quote, I'm feeling much better and I'm quite recovered. My case was bad, but not serious. The mortality in Greater Boston was frightful. He was indeed fortunate because Boston was hit very hard, about twice as hard as, as New York City. Now, soldiers could get weekend passes from training camps to travel locally unless influenza intervened. Corporal Harry Kusmal, 73rd Infantry at Camp Devons, writes to Mill Bryant in Brockton, quote, have just 10 minutes in which to write some sad news. Here it is, so prepare yourself. No passes will be issued to anyone here except in extreme cases such as death or severe illness in the family. This holds until further or future notice. Any soldier caught outside without a pass will be arrested and severely punished. Is the influenza really so bad outside the camp or is it all paper talk? That's the only reason I can see for such a ruling. However, I live in hopes. I've just got to see you pretty soon or bust. I love you so. Give a year's pay for a good hug and a kiss just at this moment. Then um, head our first gas mask instruction today and it sure needs time before one can wear the thing. Just practice in putting it on and breathing it in, breathing in it as we go into the real gas chamber next week. I love you, dearest, though I could, though I could show you how much this Sunday but once more fate interferes, curses, I'll fool him yet. Volleys of love, Harry. In town, mess cook Alustus DeWolf writes from the Commonwealth Pier to Harriet DC in Washington DC on October 2nd. He reports having just been assigned to the unfinished destroyer USS Beach, quote, I won't be going across for a few months, however. The pier is not an ideal place as it is built along the lines of an old fashioned jail and it is awful hard to get any fresh air or sunshine. It is no place to quarter thousands of men for any length of time. And there will be great rejoicing when the quarantine is lifted, although we are willing to stand it if it will check the spread of this awful epidemic of influenza." Unquote. He describes sightseeing and traveling on a furlough and closes with his host for an end of the war in a few months or a year at the most. Private Gurney A. Putnam, Company A, 212th Engineers at Camp Devons, writes from the camp hospital to his sister and family in East Andover, New Hampshire. Quote, I feel pretty good tonight. My temperature was normal this PM. I am going to get over this okay, I guess. I had most of, I feel real well this morning. A tea, good big breakfast of oat milk, of oatmeal, milk, two big warm biscuits and a big orange. I expect to get out of the hospital anytime as I feel quite good now. And, and I, I love that this letter got to him addressed to uh, rural farm delivery or uh, rural farm delivery number one, East Andover, New Hampshire. That's all you needed. Influenza impeded the war effort. A staff member at the supply company a supply department, Fleet Supply Base, U.S. Navy in South Brooklyn, New York, writes to the treasurer of Lamson and Goodnow Manufacturing in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, about the impact of illness and deaths on the office's work. He understands the difficulty the manufacturer is having filling orders and commiserates, quote, we are having considerable trouble with sick sickness in the office. One officer and five members of the clerical force have died within the last five days. 
P. McEnany, a claim agent, which he humorously writes and highlights as clam agent for the Bay State Street Railway Company in Lowell, writes to his friend and apparently former colleague, John Kelly, 4th Regiment, Charleston, South Carolina, with news from their hometown, concentrating on the epidemic. He writes, <coughs> I've had a tough time since you left me, John. That influenza has cleaned out my old home in North Chelmsford. He recounts more than a dozen cases or deaths, ending with, quote, well, John, I do not know if you keep in touch with the deaths in Lowell or not, but it is something awful. Connie Griffin is dead and buried. Mort Lenz is very low. Harry Morrill and Charlie Tilton are having a hard go of it. Pat Fells is very sick. George Gallagher lost one of his children. I, I could not commence to tell you all I know. There's just one long string of funerals every day at every home going by the square. The city is closed up tight. No, shoe, no shows, schools, salon, saloons are open. Stores are on curtailed hours, no meetings of any time. For the first time in history, the Catholic churches closed their, stores, their doors today and no services were held. All this terrible news, and yet he calls himself a clam agent. <laughs> Feel good now. A soldier at Camp Upton, New York, writes to his friend Mabel Noble back home in Stockton Springs, Maine. He notes, so you have kept clear of the flu, F-L-U-E. That's good. It is all over here, no more cases. Quarantine has been lifted for nearly three weeks so we can roam about the camp as much as we like. Uh, from the looks of the papers, we may get back to Stockton after all. I would like to be there very much. We have shows and movies by the dozen every afternoon and evening, but had rather see them down in Maine. A fellow gets tired after a while looking at other fellows all the time. He longs to see a girl smile and hear her laugh once in a while. The army is a great place, only a fellow does get lonely once in a while. A letter always cheers us up. Sergeant Eugene Tower, US Army stationed in France, writes to my own darling wifey in Cohasset on November 21st. He looks forward to eventually being sent home now that the war is over and appreciated better rations. Quote, we had macaroni and cocoa for supper tonight donated by the Red Cross Society. It tasted awfully good first time we had either one since leaving the States. Perhaps we will get fed better now that the war is over and the submarines are called off. Uh, he refers to a friend or relative of hers saying, quote, I gather from your last letter that, that Sergeant is well and on his job as he wouldn't be in France if he wasn't all right, would he? Hope he got over his influenza all right. Guess the salt air will cure him anyway as there's nothing like pure salt air to heal all lung troubles. <coughs> Excuse me. Private Clayton Adams, trunk comp Truck Company D, Second Corps Artillery Park, with the American Expeditionary Force in France, writes to his uncle Sherman Samuel Sherwood in Springfield on the 7th of December. He reports his company, uh, quote, enjoyed a fine Thanksgiving dinner. The menu consisted of roast steak, mashed potatoes, stewed tomatoes, white bread, hot chocolate, gravy, peach pie, and fancy cookies. While we didn't have turkey and all the regular fixings, we enjoyed the holiday just the same. The members of AE forces have a great deal to be thankful for this year on account of the termination of the war and the defeat of the Central Powers. The health of the majority of the troops is excellent. Comparing a situation to the home front, he says, Mother wrote Aunt May is not feeling well and that Jack had the, quote, Spanish flu, unquote. I haven't been troubled to any extent with that disease. The AE forces had less trouble with it than the troops stationed in the States. Elsewhere, Hildreth Heine was a school teacher of arithmetic, penmanship, and spelling in Indianapolis. Writing to her sweetheart, Sergeant Clever Hadley, she quotes from articles, books, and letters he reads. She reads conversations, plays, and films and keeps them up to date on news from the home front, including the impact of influenza. We have a large set of her letters, bought one at a time on eBay, and they make a fascinating account from a thoughtful narrator. October 1st, after quoting from an article on the progress of the war in Europe, she notes, quote, woman suffrage was beaten in the Senate today. I'll make no comment. Then, quote, 14 cases of influenza have been reported in the city in the last two days. The situation in the camps is better and much better at the fort. The theaters now exclude all persons who have cough or sneeze or cold. 
You must keep them busy. I've just read this, quote, next to murder, nothing is much harder to stifle than a sneeze on a picture show. I thought you might appreciate it. I love Hildreth. <laughs> <By the way. laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Here we go. Hildreth reports she is on forced vacation because the schools are closed. October 11th, quote, it seems dreadful though, when one thinks of the sorrow it is bringing to many. Influenza must be a dreadful disease, especially since influenza so often after follows. October 15th, the theaters, churches, schools, all public gatherings have been forbidden until after the 20th. Schools closed a week ago last Monday. The stores are opening at different hours and closing either earlier or later than usual to avoid congestion in the streetcars. There's been a decrease in the number of cases reported and also in the number of deaths. October 26th, I suppose you are now progressing in the art of washing clothes, or have you found a peasant woman who is glad to do it for you? Now that you know something about the problem of laundry work, I can talk to you quite freely about it and tell you our problem here at home has been simplified. We have bought an electric washer, the Eden. I don't quite see the connection yet between the name and the work, but at least it does. one doesn't feel he is in Eden doing the washing. He finds that the work is very little and not hard work at all. Now, families on the home front were encouraged to write daily to their soldiers to keep up morale. Um, still, there were delays because of the long delivery route and the millions and millions and millions of letters. <clears throat> there was a common practice that I suspect was promoted by the military or someone who I've not found yet. Note that Hildreth numbers her letters in Roman numerals up in the corner. Sequential, sequential numbers like this let a soldier know that he was receiving every letter from a sender and what order they were in. A very clever system. Some soldiers kept track of letters in their diaries or journals and checked them off. November 20th, quote, the schools are closed again until Monday on account of influenza. It seems to have grown steadily worse since our recent celebrations. Now, every time one pokes his head out of doors, he must wear a mask made of four to six thicknesses of surgeon's cloth <coughs> over nose and mouth. The order is to be enforced today. Aunt Florence and Uncle Heine were out last evening. They said the clerks in the stores and streetcar con conductors all wore them yesterday. Can you imagine how funny it must have been? I know I prefer to stay at home. We are going for a walk. No masks needed then, November 21st. The flu situation seems much better today. Oh, I would love to have had you seen Indianapolis today, clever. I grinned all the way downtown and back behind my mask. Yes, I wore one and so did everyone else. They were all kinds, large and small, thick and thin, some embroidered and one cat stitched around the edge. They were adjusted at all angles, tied around the head or hung over ears. Those seen on the street seem to be taking the, the place of bibs resting just under the chin. Oh, this is a great old world and one should surely have a sense of humor. December 1st, school opens for the third time tomorrow. The influenza situation is, is better and I fervently pray that it will remain so. We haven't taught just six weeks out of 12, I believe. <clears throat> her, un her unnumbered letter um, is written eight days to the months after Kleber left for Camp Sherman. Quote, <clears throat> we have met each other once since then, about seven months ago. Doesn't that sound startling? I can scarcely believe that the weeks have mounted so rapidly into months. I'm so glad that you have not suffered from influenza. It has been a real scourge here. I looked and I saw that Kleber left from Brest, France on the March 6th. He arrived in Hoboken on March 25th, transferred to Camp Merritt, finished his army service in April, and he and Hildreth married in 1920. <clears throat> Let's look at another example. <clears throat> Here's an interesting case study that I can use to explain a lot about correspondence at the time. And you in return will ask, well, why don't you just digitize it and put it online? In a letter sent to his mother in Cleveland, Ohio, a private in Battery E of the 64th Artillery with the American Expeditionary Force, quote, somewhere in France, says he takes, quote, great pride in saying that I haven't been sick one day while I was in the army. I have gone through two changes of climate and I think I can take good care of myself under any conditions. He expresses concern about his mother's news from home. Quote, it certainly is too bad about Irene. I hope she pulls through all right. 
it seems she ought to be able to take better care of herself. I heard that there was some sort of an epidemic of influenza and grip in the States. I was wondering how true it is. The private knew that all of his mail was subject to being read and redacted by a military censor. He is not allowed to reveal exactly where he is in case his letter falls into the wrong hands. <clears throat> so he hints at the top of the letter, he says somewhere in France. And here he suggests he is in an old French city. Well, on the envelope and in the bottom of the letter itself, <clears throat> we see where the censor stamped and signed the letter as okay to be sealed and sent to the States. You notice that there aren't any postage stamps on the envelope because soldiers overseas sent their letters for free. They just had to print or stamp or write soldier's mail, which is a form of free postage or free franking. And here it is canceled by the army with a date and the post, army post office in New York that routed millions of letters and packages to and from troops. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, I wasn't quite sure who this private J.G. Manning was. I wondered, does that say Gilmore, a name I didn't know, or Gilman, or what? So I went to AncestryLibrary.com, the, ancest the library license gateway to Ancestry.com, which gives me all the power of searching without having to have my own individual account. Let's try Gilmore and Manning and see what we get. And Bazinga, a few hits for a Joseph Gilmore Manning, born 1892 in Cleveland, which is where Mrs. Manning lives. We see his social security record. We are really fortunate that someone created a family tree that links this record and we can see he died in 1969 and, and something about his parents. Then we go to the family record. We see more details from his life story, including a family photo, photo with Joseph Gilmore front and center uh, at about age 10 or 11, I estimate. So let's just mount this letter online as part of a teaching guide or a University of Michigan-like database of influenza pandemic correspondence and diaries. Not yet. We need to confirm the private man when Private Manning died because there are copyright considerations. But the letter is more than a century old, you say. True, but an author in the US has to have died before 1952 for their unpublished manuscript, this letter, to be in the public domain now. And if we don't know the author or when they died, the term of copyright is 120 years or through 2038 for this letter. So let's find out. For Private Manning, he died in 1969. But when we look at the Find a Grave Index, something weird turns up. Is his birth year 1892, like we thought, or 1893? I don't know whether Manning has a, have a gravestone or marker, but the cemetery's memorial lists him as 1893. So when we prepare to research and compile an influenza pandemic personal narratives resource, we can contact the family and point out this discrepancy and offer them a scan of the complete letter and envelope for their family tree and request copyright permission from them to publish this letter online now before 2038. And finally, for now, when it comes to correspondence, in 2012, then Berkeley-based ant antiquarian bookseller and ephemera dealer Mark Salvaggio sold us a unique album of photos, documents, letters, and other memorabilia by and about Alton Miller, a young man from Kingston, New York, inducted into the army in mid-1918. Alton, a driver and chauffeur, starts out at Camp Dix, New Jersey, then is promoted and goes to Camp Zachary Taylor outside Louisville, Kentucky. In one of several chatty letters sent home, he proudly tells his mother about what he's learning and doing. And he uses free postage, the free stationery provided to soldiers by the YMCA or the Knights of Columbus. By comparison, the letter he sends to his father is ominous, quote, don't get frightened, but I have had the influenza for four days, but I have not let the authorities know about it. He tells his sister Ada even more describing the symptoms, all of which he had, but he thinks he's getting better. Quote, there are nearly 10,000 cases down here and 22 deaths were added today. I don't know how many deaths there are altogether. The next day, Ada, ambulances are running in every direction out here. They haven't closed the camp yet, but I think they will soon. I'm coming in good shape. I am very glad I did not report it and go to the hospital. They say you are lucky if you get out alive once you get in. I think by tomorrow I'll be all right. What do you think of the news this morning? I would like the war to end, but I would like also to get over to France. The next day, a buddy writes 
that Al is in the hospital, but there's no cause for worry. Then the chaplain notes that Al is ill with pneumonia and parents should come if they can, because although he has the best of care, he needs cheer. And then too late. Your son, Alton Miller, died. Wire me if you want remains shipped at government expense and to whom remains will be consigned. By the way, none of the high school or college students to whom I show this reported having ever seen a telegram in person before. The remainder of the album consists of more telegrams, newspaper announcements, and condolence letters, and a posthumous medal, thus the gold star rather than the blue service star. And the final entry inside the album cover, inked in the organizer's hand, reports that Alton's sister, Ada, died June 15, 1989, age 97, which was more than 70 years after her younger brother. So I'll give you a moment to dry your eyes while I take a sip of uh, Dunkin' Donuts coffee. The collection includes uniquely held printed ephemera, such as an advertising flyer touting the benefits of Vicks VapoRub with the then popular jingle, cover up your cough and sneeze. If you don't, you spread disease. Here we see a copy of ephemeral information distributed by the California State Board of Health to the public about how, about why and how to wear face masks. A fierce bidding war on a used bookseller's offer of this item on eBay probably surprised the seller and landed us this beat up book. But what does this book have to do with influenza? Well, my inf interest wasn't in the book itself, but rather the bookmark pasted inside the front cover of this volume, Deaccession from a Public Library. A Library Bureau bookmark with instructions, quote, to prevent the infection of this book first, do not cough or sneeze into the book. Always use a handkerchief. Second, do not moisten the fingers in turning the pages. The hand should always be dry and clean. Third, always keep the books closed when it is not being used. Note, persons suffering from communicable diseases and from sore throats and colds must not under any circumstances use library books. By the way, here's a bookmark I found in my dad's desk when I cleared out his house a decade ago. From 1885, 20 years after the founding of the Waltham Public Library, ordering 10,500 copies, nearly one for every resident, young and old. The library was open from one to nine so that people who worked during the day could come. Um, and very serious penalties if you, if you, if you damaged or, or lost library property. Um, finally, a medal issued by the Shanghai Mint in 2008 celebrates the healthcare heroes of the 2003 SARS epidemic. I'm looking here for a class to make an assignment to create 3D printed metallic art they create inspired by today's pandemic. Overall, this is an antiquarian collection which has great relevance for today's world. Great relevance, I think, and I thank you. Phew, made it. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Russell. I really, I really enjoyed every minute of it. Um, and it was so fascinating to me. Did, did, um, did I say Worcester and Gloucester, right? Oh, you, you got it. You got it right. Yeah, you, you still have your uh, Boston accent. <laughs> it, it, it comes and goes. <laughs> um, we do have some questions for you. So I think, we sh I think we should get to those uh, questions and comments. Um, uh, what building today was the Waltham Training School for Nurses and is it still standing? I don't know, I, I bet it isn't standing. I, I bet it got torn down and something else went up but I, I don't know exactly where it, is, where it was. Okay. I did try to find out. Um, and then one person says, uh, most nurses trained in connection with a the hospital then, is that correct? Do you, do you happen to know? Um, I'm not sure, because I, I don't think the training school for, for nurses was exactly, it was not part of the hospital, it was separate. And a lot of nurses were being trained for home health care, not just for hospital nursing. Okay. Um, 
Among the materials you've collected and studied, were there any by people skeptical of government advisories and vaccinations as there are today? Seems some of that was reflected in the cartoon you showed. Yeah, I, I wasn't really finding it in the letters, but you certainly do see it in the, in the newspaper reports, people challenging the mask wearing, people challenging other things. There was a vaccine introduced in the fall of 1918, um, but it was a vaccine, it was an antibacterial vaccine and influenza is a virus, but they didn't know influenza was a virus and didn't have it isolated until 1930. So the vaccine that they created was taking care of some other symptoms. And, and remember, <clears throat> people weren't dying so much of the influenza, but as of pneumonia that followed on it very quickly, very, very potently, and killed people within days. Uh, diff, diff, um, yeah, very, very, very severe. So no, there wasn't really an, any uh, anti-vaccination sentiment that I could see because, although people griping about all the vaccinations they were getting otherwise, in the military, they were getting jabbed all the time for things. Yeah, okay. Um, did any of the materials you studied give insight into medical treatment, both professional and home remedies? There were all sorts of uh, home remedies about gargling, uh, eating onions. <clears throat> so people were eating onions every day. Um, a gargling with, with, with salt water. Um, but for the most part, what was happening is influenza would hit, it would hit hard. It would, it would just consume a community, take up, they would, they would quickly take over every facility, build tents and stuff, recruit everyone in the community to do nursing and just try to nurse people back into health with, with fluids and, and, and soup to, to get them over the hump uh, if, if they could recover. They, they didn't have a good treatment for the influenza. Mm -hmm. So just bed rest and fluids. Bed rest and, and, and try, to get, try to get past it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, how did you obtain these wonderful resources? The postcards are superb. I was excited to hear about Shelburne Falls as my mom was born there. Uh, eBay. Um, I, <clears throat> I had permission for quite a long time to buy things on, on eBay. It's a university credit card. And eight people saw every transaction, so I couldn't siphon any money off myself. Um, but eBay was a, is a great resource. And people on eBay put up photographs of so many things that you can, you can tell what you're getting. And I wasn't, I wasn't stiffed more than maybe 10 times out of about 15,000 transactions on eBay for various things that, that I bought there. 15,000, wow. Yeah, o over, over 20 years, yeah. Wow. Not, not just this, but so, so many other things. Uh, just, just a great resource. And also some things like that, that, that album from a bookseller um, who, who sold it and a few things gifted to us. Um, but this, this, was a, a, this is a really great example of just starting from scratch and just accumulating until you hit a point where there's actually something there and you can start to see some things and researchers come in and can start looking for trends. And even, as I said, looking for things that... that so like at, at Thanksgiving time, I... I I uh, excerpt about a dozen letters describing what the soldiers are eating in their camps mm -hmm. or overseas for Thanksgiving. And I, I, I said a couple of them, them here, I, and I love that, fancy cookies yeah. uh, and white bread and tomatoes and, and things. It's like, you know, maybe not the greatest diet, but boy, that was, that was good compared to what they were getting. Right, right. <laughs> So about how much would, would one of those letters go for on eBay? Uh, when I started, very cheap. But then other people started noticing and mm -hmm. it became competitive. And now uh, there are a couple of people who are sitting on enormous caches of World War I material. 
and sell, get, selling them off at like $40 a letter. Wow. Um, but I used the income off of endowment funds to buy this stuff. So I, so with this, I get to tell students and so forth that your, your registration fees are not going up so I can buy an influenza letter. Your registration fees go for electricity and salaries and so forth. But we, we really depend on donors mm -hmm. to endow things so that we can use the income to build the historical collections. Yeah, cool. Um, I heard newspapers were told not to report on the flu because it would hurt the war effort. But everyone seems to have been writing and talking about it. Did readers notice that the news didn't reflect reality? I, when I, like when I went looking for Waltham reports, they were reporting. Hmm. Things maybe early on, maybe maybe back in the spring, when the when the first in, the first wave was happening, and what I was mostly talking about was the second, the most intense, horrific wave was in the fall. But by then, um, you know, notice people are also just talking so almost just the facts about this horrible stuff because they've been dealing with war. Um, and 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 sending the sending the troops overseas and dealing with that, and so this was like almost like one more thing. Um, what did happen was that sure there might be closures of things, of churches and schools and so forth, but then everything would open up again when there was a liberty a li there was a big i think the fourth or fifth liberty loan drive was was that october november um, and so huge crowds gathering the thing you don't want happening during during the pandemic right. and and then tens of thousands of soldiers at a time in a training camp so just these conditions where it's rife for um, for the influenza to spread Right, right. But it's really stunning in something like in a diary, someone will write from upstate New York, um, Mrs. Jones and her husband down the street died of the influenza uh, this week on, on, on Sunday. The apple harvest is good. So it's like just the facts. They're Very just one more thing to deal with. Right, right. Wow. Um, Given the censor censorship by the military, did you find any coded messages about, about origin? Um, uh, I know that's where the, where the uh, letters were coming from. Spain, yeah, not France, really. China, no? No, no, I, I, I didn't, but there, there probably was maybe, you know, I'm looking in October when things are going very well for the allies, so, um, but the, the but the censorship also continued in some some places during the occupation for a little while. Um, but I, I no I I didn't see that people were really trying to tell exactly where they were. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Great job, Russell. This is fascinating information. Uh, a lot of um, smiley emojis and hand clapping. Who is that? Um, <laughs> the, uh, oh, someone says the Waltham Training School for Nurses is still standing. Really? Behind the, behind the Episcopal Church on Main Street. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, it doesn't say what it's used for right now. I so, did not know that. That's pretty well, cool. I, I, I went there, uh, Christ Church, the, uh, the, the one made of stones. Yeah. The Fieldstone yeah. Church. Um, I have to say, I was so struck by the similarities, um, similarities of dealing with the flu uh, between then and COVID, um, you know, closing schools, businesses, um, telling people to stay away from each other, masks, hand washing. Um, you know, our, our tools are very, very minimal. Yeah, and yet uh, could be very potent. The, the closures were, were much briefer than the closures we're seeing with, with COVID. Huh. Um, 
my bet is also is it's because the influenza in 1918 had such a rapid onset, rapid hit, and and then fall off. So um, it hits you before you know it. I I I bought from a a dealer the medical reports written by someone from from a camp, and they were daily reports, and I was really excited that they're daily. And then you, you, you get to October and then they suddenly stop and then they continue, start again in November. And I thought, did I, did someone pull out all the good stuff? And then I looked and I said, and I saw, no, the one in October was like number 45. The one in November was number 46. In between there, when the influenza hit, it was so overwhelming to personnel. They, they didn't have the time to do this mimeographed news sheet. They were trying to just keep up with trying to, to save people. And so it wasn't missing. Uh, and they had to do then retrospective statistics. Uh, but they kept good, the military, the government kept very good statistics. So you can go back and see all sorts of, 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 of data. Yeah. What was happening, but it was just so overwhelming. And, and time and time again, in the letters and so forth, you, 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 see people writing about everyone volunteering to be nurses or to do or to drive or to take food to people or even just to, to check on their neighbors and see if they if they were okay yeah the mail was picked up twice a day so people are always writing about oh i'm going to sign off now because the postman is about to come and it's like 10 o'clock at night um but uh that's what they depended on yeah and people were expected to write, the home front was expected to write every day to keep up with the morale of troops. And it, it looks like many people did do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you have a sense of sort of the similarities between the experiences back then and our experiences and also the differences. Could you talk about that a little? Well, I mean, some of the things I tried to pull into the talk uh, well, mask wearing, for example, um, uh, the the humor of it, the the resistance of it, some people putting it under their chin and so forth. Um, more more than the similarities, I mean, one of the things that really just stands out to me is is how bluntly people responded to it, um, and and I think because. Death rates were higher then, um, not just for influenza, but, but for other things. So people were more accustomed to seeing death. There were a lot of deaths from influenza happening in the home. Whereas today, we expect it to be in the hospital or in, in, a, in a facility. Right. Um, but they, there just might not have been that facility or people were accustomed to taking care of their own at home. Um, and then also a, a big difference, of course, is that the influenza in 1918, the people who were most at risk to die were like the 20 to 40 year olds. Mm -hmm. And that's, op that's very different than today with COVID where older people were most at risk. Right. Um, and there was a fear that maybe very young people would be at risk today too. but but it's a different profile right. of, of the disease. Very different. And with that, and with that, um, um, with that profile, then you have 20 year olds who are off at military camps, crowded in, worst situation for them. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Couple of other but, but 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 another thing though is that I just love the way the people write. Of course, I, I did select some good examples, but just all in all, I mean, I, I, they're the the they're writing diaries, they're writing letters to people, and it's just some really interesting stuff to read. You're you're peeking over their shoulders. Mm. Um, so a question that that comes up with the baby record books that we collect and also comes up with this is um, 
how, why did you, how could you get them? Why would people part with this stuff? Mm. And uh, it's because offspring don't have an interest in the history of their families. Some families dead end and there, there are no people to, in, to inherit. And so things get, get sold off. Um, storage lockers get, get emptied and sold off. Um, but I think for the most part, it's just, it's just from disinterest. Yeah. Um, um, that's why I think when, when we digitize um, and we'll be, we'll be look, we'll, we'll be doing a lot of research on ancestry.com, we'll be able to point out to people that these things exist and, and offer to put up digitized letters on, on their ancestry um, 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 family trees. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Um, I just want to read you a couple more comments okay. that have come in. Um, uh, interesting to hear about the masks, including uh, the fancy ones. Um, thanking you now for a fascinating talk, especially a look at the actual correspondence. And you made history come alive. So oh, thank, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's the fun part of my job as opposed to the meetings. This, this, this is the stuff that really makes it worth it. Is, and, and the reason why we have this stuff in a library is for people to find out about and to come in and use. Mm. So all of the stuff that we have, people can come in and use our, and get through our library and take images of it and so forth. And, um, that, that's the reason why you have historical collections is not to hide it away, but rather to use it and learn things from the past and have some maybe rediscover or rework. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. It's a wonderful uh, treasure trove. Go and use the, uh, the history room at the Waltham Public Library. Yes, or- as the stuff you can dig into. Yes. Definitely. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think it's uh, eight o'clock. So Good I luck with the new high school. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Um, thank you again, uh, Russell Johnson. This was fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I think we had a very engaged audience. Um, so I want to thank all of you for tuning in and um, have a good evening. Good night. And we are off the air. And we're off. <laughs>